Three, two, one. Welcome back to The Process. Today's episode is with one of my favorite artists, Azima, also known as Classical Bay. She's an incredible violinist who brings the world of classical music to the world of contemporary and hip hop music in a very special way. So I decided I wanted to talk to her about the process of perfecting your craft. And this is a very special episode because it's not just for people in music. If you have anything you care about and you want to work towards perfecting it, what she has to say will totally resonate with you. Welcome to the process. I'm Azima. so happy Hi. to be here with you. Uh, me too, finally. Finally. Years it's been later. Three years? I think three years. Well, not three years since I've seen you because I ran into you at the airport. Like two <laughs> weeks ago. A couple of months ago or a couple of weeks ago. A couple of weeks something ago. like that. But we did a campaign together and we met and I started watching all of your work and then I started saving all of your work and then I started re-watching your like 15 second videos, 30 second videos, 60 second videos and I, I just kept thinking to myself, when is a full album coming out? So we can get into that conversation of a little bit. I mean, likewise. All of my stuff, album I'm is lovely. never coming out. Not the album. I mean, I know maybe you're going to have like a mixtape or something. Yeah, at definitely least a mixtape. For your fans. But... I'll freestyle over your, over your <laughs> no music. Rapping. Yes. I used to do that in high school. I think it needs to be. I was come actually back. pretty good. I'm, I'm sure you're going to crush cool. it. We'll do a collab album. It'll be great. <laughs> I, so I want to ask you where's your head at these days? Oh, man. Um, everywhere and also nowhere. I'm kind of. Very spacey, Nora. Just so you know, I'm kind of just in my own world all the time. I think that that's how all you are time. able to do what you do. Though. I don't even know what day it is today. Like no idea. I couldn't tell you what day it is today either. Absolutely to be honest. No idea. But is it because you're so busy, or is it because you're so immersed in something specific, or is it just because? Well, right now I'm working on this project where I'm taking classical pieces and making them modern. So I've been doing because it's Beethoven's 250th birthday this year. <gasps> I know, the greatest. I love, um, I love Beethoven. So I've been doing, just thinking of a lot of just iconic Beethoven melodies and how to rework them. So I've just been thinking about that a lot. That's and incredible. I have some deadlines. Do you have a method to how you approach that? I just kind of like feel that when you're in a creative space, the most important thing is just to give yourself space. Like I think it's so easy to be rushing around and doing all these things and whatever, whatever. But for me, that's not when I'm able to really generate ideas. I just need to have space just to think. And... Well, because ideas don't come in those moments. Like yeah. they, they always talk about, do you ever get your creative ideas when you're in your office or in your workplace? And everyone's like, no. And it's like, well, okay, so when do you get those ideas? That's when you're in the shower, exactly. driving, and you wake up walking. at the grocery store, just these random places. Yeah. So I've just been really thinking of uh, just allowing those ideas to come because I'm, you know, working on an album. I have a project coming out, but I'm also working on an album. So it's just a lot of creation is happening right now. So that's kind of where my head is. So it's everywhere, but also nowhere. That's actually, that makes sense. it's a perfect answer now yeah. that you back it up with that. Yeah. <laughs> but this album and your work is a long time coming. You've been doing this for a really long time. Take us back to the first time you picked up a violin. Oh, wow. I was three years old. Um, I've been saying four in interviews, but my mom was like, it's actually three. Like, she's like, Please. Your mom remembers. She remembers totally. better than I would, I'm sure. But I was three years old, and I was in Nebraska, which is where I'm from. You know, the only person of color in my Montessori school was on a farm, and they had a violin program. And these kids had these violins, and I just begged my parents. What did your dad want for you? I mean, doctor. Obviously. Maybe a lawyer. Lawyer, engineer. I feel like being a mildly scummy. Um, but yeah, he was like basically a doctor. Like that was, and that's what I, I studied pre-medicine in my undergrad. Like I, you know, I did Latin. Like I was like on that medical track. Was that for him? Yeah, it was for him. And cause I was like, you know, this, the obedient firstborn, whatever, whatever. Um, and then I finally, like, I remember I was maybe 19. I was like, look, I want to be a violinist. And I stopped and I, I stopped doing the medical stuff and I just did violin and he was really disappointed. And that was kind of my first time. 
I guess, saying to myself, this is who I am. Like, this is who I want to be. Um, and I think growing up, I mean, another thing is just the classical tradition is a very, it's an obedient space as well. Like, you really have to follow what's been done. You can, you, you want to challenge things, but not too much. You can Why move, but not too much. You can change notes, but not too much. I think it's because there's so much respect for the greatness that's been made. And I, and I am one of the, I respect it so much. I have so much reverence for like Isai and Beethoven and all, Bach, all these things. It's, it's really some of the greatest human creations to me of all time. But that said, things have to change. And it's, you know, I think especially as a woman of color in this space, it's my job. I can, to really be that, that vehicle for change and to shake things up. So that's kind of how I, I've chosen to see it, but that didn't come till later in my violin career, you know, yeah, of until course. relatively recently. But I remember when I was 19, I, I said to my dad, I just want to be a violinist. And I wanted to be in an orchestra or play string quartet. So I studied, studied, studied and practiced and, you know, did those things. And then I remember sitting in orchestra thinking, like, this still isn't me. Like, I still haven't found what really speaks to my soul musically and creatively. And when you're a creator or when you're creative, that's the most important thing is that it's resonating with your so or else you're not going to like live this difficult freelance lifestyle and struggle. You know, if you're not getting that gratification, yeah. then why are you doing it? So I, um, I moved to New York and I went to the new school. And I, um, when I was there, I was able to learn production. And I make all my music. I make beats. I do all that stuff. Um, and I became obsessed. Once again, just obsessed. And I started looping box solo sonatas in my apartment, in my little one-bedroom apartment with my roommates. And they were very patient. I was up to like 5 a.m. I get so obsessed. And I was just learning and learning and looping and experimenting. And then I posted something on social media and got such positive response. What was the post? I think it was like a Bryson Tiller jamming with like Bach in there. I don't even know. I think we took it down. I mean, that's a great collaboration. Yeah, but he like tweeted me back like that's a bomb. I was like, what? It's Bryson Tiller? And then right? I just, you know, kind of, I just kept experimenting. And then shortly after Beyonce reached out and that was kind of like a big moment of, I think you're on the right track. Um, I mean, if Beyonce gives you a stamp of approval. Yeah, it was just amazing. Like her director was like, um, her musical director was like, we love Azima Style. Um, my client, she thinks you're awesome. I can't tell you who the client is due to a very strict NDA, but will you play with us? And I was like, what? 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 Yeah, it was a Facebook message from her musical director. And I don't even check Facebook, you know, it's like. Yeah, it's, did you Google the person? No, I didn't. So I was about to turn it down just because I was really busy. And, you know, like, again, I'm a little bit, I don't Google people. I, if, even in this day and age, I still don't Google people. And I need to. It's a very important <laughs> thing just to Google people. But I, I remember he called me and he's like, look, E, I want you to Google my name right now. And I Googled his name. And I was like, oh, my God, he produced Lemonade. He, like, just on the run. Like, it's Beyonce's guy. So I said yes. And I worked with her for three years. And it was awesome. And then after that, I had another moment of, like, this still isn't me. Really? This still isn't me. Well, why? I, what, what were you doing for those three years? Um, basically doing her strings. For her music? Yeah, for her music. Uh, you know, she we had some one-offs, like some title things. The Coachella thing was a one-off. Right. And then after that, they actually asked me to go on tour, and I said no, because I love Beyonce. Again, so much respect, like Bach, Beethoven, so much respect, but I'm not doing Izima. I'm not really fulfilling my job on this earth, which is to, I guess I think of me when I was little mm. and how I would have loved to have seen someone doing what I'm doing then. A woman of color, changing, challenging, experimenting, mm. doing those things. And that's, I believe, my passion and my purpose on this earth. So what was the process like of deciding to trust yourself and your skill as opposed to working under one of the greatest, the, the greatest musicians of all time. Yeah. Um, well, a few things. First of all, it was the easiest decision, but yet so hard. Yeah. Like I, you know, you just know you have these instinctual reactions. Of course, intuition. So like, then, it was very simple, but it was hard to, I guess, tell myself I'm going to believe in you this much that we're going to give up this income, this prestige, whatever, whatever, and just go solo. Like I came, I moved to New York. I got this super cheap $700 bedroom, one bedroom place. Um, and I was just like, I have to figure this out, you yeah. know? And then it's amazing. Like a few months later, I got two record deal offers. 
like after trusting in yourself yeah, and your craft. Exactly. And I was living in this tiny, like, like so tiny space, you know, because I, I needed to save the money I'd earned. I had no security blanket. You know, my, you know, my family is not, you know, I, I was really on my own and I um, shortly had those offers. And then I was like, I think I'm doing the right thing. I think yeah. I'm doing the right thing. And then, you know, it's just, I don't know. It's just, it's God. It's, it's the way of the universe. When you trust in yourself and when you put in that, the biggest investment is that trust. Everything comes once you believe in yourself. I was just saying this yesterday. I was working on memorizing this speech that I had to give for an event yesterday and it was brand new. And I was looking at the words and I was looking at, and I was like, I, I've been doing this for so many years. But even when you're looking at your work, it's sometimes really hard to process what you're doing. And you have to have this full conversation with yourself in trusting your mind, body, and spirit. Like you right. have to trust that you're going to show up for yourself on stage. Exactly. You have to trust that it's going to come out, that the yeah. flow is going to be there. And that's not something you can really practice. You can practice your craft and you can practice the skill, but the flow and the intention behind it yeah. is something that you have to work on trusting with yourself. So how, when you were younger, how did you learn to trust in yourself when you were dealing with pressures of parents who may have given you pressure in other spaces or wanting you right. to pursue in other things or the societal pressure of you being a woman of color and being a violinist in Nebraska and what being in an orchestra looks like or even taking you know a modern twist on classical music which is still there's still a stigma around doing that as well right I mean, what, yeah. how did you trust yourself in all of that well I think when you love what you're doing it's very easy to trust in yourself when you're doing something you truly are passionate about and love. And that's always fueled, I guess, these, these leaps I've made, these very scary decisions I've made to leave Beyonce, to not do medicine, to, you know, all of these big decisions um, have been fueled by just this love and respect for the craft and for how many years I've put into it and, and how it's really been my best friend in times when I felt very lonely, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, that's kind of first and foremost what's fueled that trust. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, there's just so many experiences I can speak to where you're discouraged. Um, I remember when I was in orchestra, um, it was my very first orchestra, and I auditioned, and I worked so, so, so hard. Like, How old were you? I was probably 10. Yeah, my first orchestra, or 11. I was in middle school, and I had skipped a grade, so I was like the young kid, like the little renty young kid. But anyway, <laughs> so it was my first orchestra, and I auditioned, and I worked so hard, and I and I and I got in there. I played my heart out, killed it in my opinion, got the results, and I was fifth chair. I was just like devastated. And for people who don't know what fifth chair is, can you so yeah, what that so is? basically in orchestra you have the first chair, that's the concert master or concert mistress. First, second, third, fourth, it kind of just goes on, 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 right? So there's first violin, second violins, violas, cellos, double basses, then the whole orchestra. So first chair is kind of like the spot. The spotlight is the on spotlight, that person. Exactly. You tune the orchestra. There's some responsibility. So I auditioned and um, I got fifth chair, and. I was just devastated, and I came home to my dad, and my I'm mixed race. My dad's from Guyana, my mom is American German, and um, I told my dad, like, Dad, I'm fifth chair, but I work so hard. I don't understand. I mean, it's like you're black. This is not a world where people see us, especially when you're doing something that is a white space. He said this in not as complicated of words, but basically, he's like, people don't see you for your talent; they'll see you for your skin color. So you have to work incredibly hard. And I, I, I was like, what? You know, you're a kid. You don't really understand yeah. these things. But that was my first awakening. Is that um, the first time you recognized the intensity around your skin color and your race? Yeah. I was just feeling so rejected and so sad because I knew I was better than the other kids. I knew yeah. I was so much better than them. Like, they couldn't play. They couldn't shift. They couldn't do vibrato. Like, you know, these just these basic technical things that... You're learning it as a violin student, you know. So I went to the conductor and I was like, there's been a mistake. 
you, as a 10, 11 year old, yeah, like, you made a mistake. You made a mistake. She's like, okay, well, we have a thing called the challenge system where you can challenge a person in front of you into an, 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 an anonymous taping, right? What? So you have a piece. This it's is like, so intense for middle it's school. It's like very intense, very right? like Game oh of Thrones, God. the battle, the duel. So I challenged a girl in front of me. It was like tape A or tape B. The whole class listens and judges. Tape A, I advance. Challenge the next girl, tape A, tape B. Did you, you know do about this before this moment? No, I was like, there's been something wrong. So she's like, well, this is what we can do. And it's actually a very just system. Yeah. So I challenge, 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 and I make my way to first. And I just stayed there until I left for college. And honestly, like, that example to me is just, is, you know, back to your, your original question. It's just the trust in yourself, the trust to say, look, wow, like, there's something wrong. You've made a mistake. I am not what you see. I am, you know, you think of Kobe Bryant. They didn't know he was Kobe Bryant, but Kobe always believed he was Kobe Bryant. Right. You have to believe, I will have Grammys and Oscars. You guys don't see it yet, yeah. but I will. I know. I like, felt, you just yeah. know you know your worth and you know where you're going. So you, you, you choose not to be afraid by the hiccups and the upsets, whether if it's money or, or someone not seeing you. Or I've, I've lost so many things. I've been rejected by so many things. And how did you deal with that rejection? I don't know. You, like, you're sad and then you get over it and you practice the next morning. But what about people who struggle to get over the hump of getting over rejection? I mean, where does ego play a role in that? Oh, my God. Your ego is just <laughs> the problem for everything. I mean, I, well, one thing I really believe, and I say this to myself every day, what's mine is mine. Mm -hmm. What's yours is yours. And, and, and it will be provided. It really will be provided. And I think, it, especially in such a competitive industry of music making and you know, entertainment, it's just so cutthroat. I really have to walk with that and understand that if I'm rejected for something, it maybe is preparing me for something greater. You that know, sounds, and I think if I you believe totally that, you believe just, that. yeah, you just, you work harder and you're inspired. And that's just how I've chosen to see it because mm -hmm. I've just faced so much rejection. Um, and I'm, I, I work to be the best that I can be and that's all I can do. Where did you seek guidance in the process of perfecting your craft? My teachers, my mentors, I've relied so heavily on them. Um, and there's still, I still have a mentor. Um, I still have a teacher who I work with and she's incredible. I feel like you always need a mentor. Always, always. And I'm, and I'm actually, that's like my resolution for 2020 is getting more mentors in my life and not just musically, but in just different spaces because yeah. I don't want to confine myself just to music. But um, mentors are so important. Um, day one people, not the fake people, but like the yeah. real day one people, whether it's family, friends, people who really know you and, and have your interest and were there before whatever, whatever, you know? Um, I've relied very much on that. I think for me, faith, um, believing in something that's greater than humans and this yeah. world is um, how I can see purpose and can make sense of a lot of things that are senseless. Um, that's a big thing for me. And then passion and love for what I do. Like, I truly love what I do. Like, I I feel so lucky. That's amazing. Tell me about your relationship with the violin as a tool to create. Um, well, it's my... There it is. <laughs> I have several violins, but You can this hold is, it during this interview. Can I hold it during yeah, this? Yeah, you can totally... It'll be... <laughs> you can grab it and hold it, and it'll be like... Your baby. You want me to grab it? If you want. It's fine. Is it doing is it doing okay? He's great. He's great. Does he have a name? His name's Toto. Toto? Yeah. Why do I know that name? From um the the, the dog, Dorothy's dog. The Wizard of Oz, right? Yeah, Toto. Toto, obviously. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I've had to separate myself a little bit from the violin. I in in the sense that when I started making my own music, I had to realize I'm not a violinist. I, yes, I'm a violinist, but sometimes when you're, you, your identity is literally an object, you can kind of lose sight of your own voice. It's kind of like if you're too attached to your physical body. It can be a limitation. If you're very beautiful, it can be a limitation to seeing your actual worth. Does that make sense? That makes total sense. Yeah, so I kind of had to separate from the violin. Cause How did you do that? I started writing my music. I started singing very badly. Like just challenging myself as a musician outside of the violin, mm. um, working on beats and making and, and taking production classes. And, 
and changing my violin, distorting the sound, like doing these different, doing different techniques that I would never have done as a classical player, taking jazz violin lessons, just really mixing up this notion of what it is. I guess you would compare it to dyeing your eyebrows blonde, like really changing your physical face to understand that you are not your face, if that's an appropriate comparison. Yeah, it's almost comparison. taking a radical step in building your individuality exactly. and your identity. Yeah. What's interesting about your relationship with the violin and the process of not breaking up with the violin, but like getting some space and really finding yourself is that the violin itself as an object is you know, based on voice and based on something that is so human. Yeah. So how do you correlate the relationship between the object and the object's spirit that is so human? Well, I mean, I think the best way to connect that is just when I'm performing and people say, oh, I get chills, or they're crying, or they're actually feeling the voice through the sound waves of my fingertips and my heart in the instrument. And that's something that's so powerful, and that connection is very real. Um, and that's, for me, the greatest reminder of what I do is actually a human thing and not just a physical instrument, which I think when you're in school and when you're in conservatory, it's very technical. It's like, tick, tick, tick. like I can play this faster than you. I can play this. And you know, violinists, we're nuts. We're absolutely nuts. We're very neurotic, obsessive people. And, you know, when you're in that type of environment of the classical space, you forget about the human quality of, of what we're actually doing is music and right. connection. Can you tell me a little bit about how the violin resembles the voice? Well, um, the vibrato of the fingertips is like the voice. Um, the chords are like your vocal chords, the strings. So let me grab it. Like, you know, there are four. Hi, Toto. There are four strings. And actually, the cello is more similar to the range of the human voice. This is much higher. But um, the, like, the. Um, so vibrato, I don't know if you know. Vibrato, yeah. Is, yeah. But for our viewers and listeners. For our viewers, us. so just let it be way. It's just so human. And like the way that your fingers and your flesh, it's, it's all just a connection directly from your heart and soul. And I think for me, what I had to realize is this box of wood, as expensive as this box of wood is, and as old as it is, and as much tradition and, and perfection has gone into it, it's still just a box of wood. Mm. And that's not enough to connect. You have to find something bigger. And, and that's kind of where the perfection of your, you know, you perfect the craft of the technique, but then there's another step, which is the art. Mm. So how do you... Would you call like the art, the spirit and soul that comes out of a tool? Yeah, it's like a painter. You have your tools, but there's something, you know, there's something Picasso had other things come out which, are, which other people couldn't do with those same tools. Do you know what's gonna come out every single time you play? I hope, I, yes, that's the craft. You know, you're like, you know, there are no frets. So you have to know, oh, this note is a G sharp. Like you have to know the pitches and everything and understand that. Mm -hmm. When I'm freestyling, for instance, I don't always know what's going to come out, but I have, but I have a roadmap. What does the roadmap look like? If I'm playing a classical piece from memory, I may have more of a map that's based on my environment. Mm -hmm. Like if it's a very complicated piece, I may have it memorized in terms of like my house. I don't know if it's making sense. No, that makes sense, yeah. But then if it's more a free-flowing thing, I may just not actually have a physical map. It may just be something more in my body. I want it to go up, and then I want it to go down, and then I want it to... Do you... Okay, so when you're freestyling and whatever comes out comes out, can you look back on that and know what the story that you were telling was? Oh, that's a great question, Nora. Yeah. Well, um, a story question. Yeah, or if, it's, if not the story, I can know the feeling. The feeling mm. that I, I had when I was doing it. Like, I remember for Money, I did this video of Money, Cardi B. Yeah, and the feeling I, I loved it, that video. Thank you, but the feeling was like, I wanted it to be these little, like, dancing monsters. Like, tick -a -tick -a -tick -a -tick -a like, it's money. <laughs> it's like, the problem. Is money, money dancing is like, monsters? Yeah, money is like a problem. Money is like the source of so many problems. Yeah. So I was like, let me just make it this, like, it's like mildly demonic. Like, the way it's like... 
kind of like nasty. Wait, do a little more of that. I loved that. Oh my gosh, that's like, um, I remember. Money, like capitalism. But I can tell like, that that's what it's about. Systematic issues. But it's funny because people listen to it and they're like, this is lit. I like it is lit. But it's also, I don't know, I just like to have deeper things in everything. Okay, so then tell me about how when you, you know that story, right? Yeah. And I think that whenever anybody does their craft, they have this internal story that they're telling through it. How do people relay that story to their audience and does it always have to be relayed? I don't think it always has to be relayed. I don't, I, I, you know, I, I'm blessed to have a non-lyrical form of expression, like a non-verbal form of expression. I, I'm not the best with words and I like to leave that to the You're experts. pretty good with words. Experts like You're you. You're pretty good with words. <laughs> my mom's a writer, so I have like very high expectations of my, my verbal usage. And I feel like it's not my, sound is my medium and I, and I just get so much more with sound and chords and harmony. Yeah. And I think, you know, in this day and age where there's so much talking, I, I sometimes feel like, let me just give you sound and if you want to see, not everybody, I'm sure most people didn't see that type of thing for money, but that cover could have been so many different things. Right. It could have been, you know, it's just, um, you know the song? Mm -hmm. I could have done so many different. I, I already like hear the rest of the song playing. Yeah, I could have done so many different things, but I chose, I chose that. And I, and I think for people who are and maybe listen to it again and again and again, or specifically people who are maybe instrumentalists or musicians, they might ask, why did, why did she pick that? And that's what I do when I listen to, to music. I'm like, mm -hmm. why are they using these words? Why are they, why do they do that harmony right there? So like, you what apply is your mindset to how you consume other people's crafts. Yeah. Specifically like instrumental music. Like why did they slow down there? Why is there, um, I don't know. I just, that's just how I listen to it. I like to analyze. Well, so then music. how does intention play a role in what you do? Well, um, with every note that I, every note I use is, in, is intentional because mm -hmm. I could have used infinite possibilities. I could have done different strokes. I could have done different bowings, different rhythms. You know, there's infinite possibilities and everything that I put in my music has an intentional reason for being there. Um, and if people are aware of that it's a, it doesn't I don't want people to, I don't want people to be so like in their head when they're listening to my music mm. but I am a little bit of a I like to think about things and for me that intention from my side is something that I want to put in and if people yeah and I feel like when people consume it that way you either appreciate it because it's just really good yeah or if you share a similar mindset, you appreciate it because you know it was very intentional. Yeah, exactly. And I think at the end, it's art. It's not, it can be very serious, but it's also not that serious. It's music. It's just, it, it's good music or it's bad music. You know, the intention behind it, if people are aware and want to go there, that's awesome. Like, I'm all for it. I encourage it. But also, sometimes you just want to listen and chill. Yeah. Well, as an artist, one of the most common things artists struggle with is the sense of perfectionism. Oh, yeah. And always wanting to create something so perfect before putting it out. You are working on releasing your album. How long have you been working on that album? And how has any struggle with perfectionism impacted that timeline? Oh, my gosh. It's just held things up immensely. I have a whole album I did not release because it's too wild. What does too wild mean? <laughs> it's like money. It's just too, it's too much. It's just, it's not yet. This is more like 10 years later. Mm. It's just too wild. Yeah, so this project that I'm releasing, I have been working on for a very long time. And as a perfectionist, it's, it can be an excruciating process. But I think you have to just kind of release and just put it out there. Like you can't sit on your music for years and years and years, because that's ultimately, I think, really selfish. Like our job as artists are to share, it's for, to share with the world and share ideas and, and who knows who you're going to inspire. So the nice thing about having a label is there are deadlines. This needs to be out by April 14th. 
So I've been just like in here working away, la la la, and sending stuff to my producers. And of course with the mixes, I'm just like, this note, is the EQ is like a little bit off. Can we adjust the frequency? You know, like I'm, I'm yeah. really over the top and they're like, we have to stop. And you're like, it's okay. But does that, how do you become comfortable with that? Um, I think you have to realize that you are mildly psychotic and no one's going to hear it the way you hear it. Yeah, and that's, that's also, so it's also music. It, I, I think for me, that's a very important thing is music is meant to be enjoyed. Mm. You know, it's, it's, it's not that serious, you know, like, and not yeah. in like a disrespectful way, but just, you have to just release it. It's art. It's, it's, it's ultimately if we come from the source, our creative creativity comes from the source. You can't just hoard it. You have to give it back, you know? Yeah. So I think that's a big form of peace for me just to get it out there. Well, so then would you say that in the process of perfecting your craft, you have to accept imperfection? Yes, you do. And honestly, imperfection is what makes things real and authentic. And in my opinion, perfect. Like, I think that's yeah. what the, that's the perfect that we should strive for. That is the balance. Yeah. Yeah. It's the imperfections. You mix classical. I mean, you're, people literally call you classical bae. Yes. You mix <laughs> classical with hip hop and modern music. How has that been received from the classical community? Um, not Be so, honest. Not so well. I do get some uh, haters. Do they play the violin? Do they play like really they play the violin. money music? No, <laughs> they, they don't. Do, I mean, they're great violinists. They're, I mean, I, I don't know. They're just violinists in the classical space. Um, and, you know, they're just people who feel that what I do is a bit disrespectful. It's um, blasphemous. It's whatever, whatever. Um, and, and I understand taking something that they that they respect so much and putting, you know, ratchet beats. Perhaps that's disrespectful in to some. But the thing that we have to remember is that when Bach was writing, this was like Ed Sheeran. Like Bach at his time was Drake, just cranking out songs like every week. You know, like the, this was the popular music. So to go back in time and study this old stuff, they weren't doing that. Right. They were writing the hot new music of their time. So I honestly think they would actually very much approve. That's such an interesting thought because we we are constantly looking to all of these older figures and these historic figures for their approval. I think about that a lot with even just the presidency. Everyone's like, yeah, yeah being like George Washington, like all these people. And I'm just like, we have to evolve. And there's a way to evolve. And in my opinion, the way that you evolve with music actually makes it more accessible. So that's why I think that you are bringing an art to audiences who may never have been introduced to it as much yeah. or never have been able to see themselves in your position. So how, and that's a big thing. And I get so many, I mean, most of the emails I get are from like little kids in orchestra mm -hmm. and they're black and brown. And like, I remember I got one last week and she's like, I'm the only brown person in my orchestra. I have an audition coming up. Can you give me some tips? And like, I, it's just one of those things where you're like, oh my God, like that means so much to me. And yeah. I actually, um, in response to that, I have a foundation, which was just made official this Yay, week. It's called Heartstrings Foundation. And it's a music educational tool for everyone, but specifically for visibility and um, it's academy. Um, we have a location on the Upper West Side and it's super exciting to be launching that. But um, that's something that just means so much to me is just letting everybody know you can be in Carnegie Hall. You can be... In the Supreme Court, you can be the president. You can do anything you want to do. First, believe in yourself. Secondly, you're going to get haters, but just move on and keep going. Work harder. You know, don't let that distract you. And and third, remember that I don't know. For me, faith is just such a big part of, yeah. of understanding the world. And it's like none of this is ours. So share and be generous and live your light and your truth and you will be rewarded. That's kind of my, what I tell all these tell kids. Tell it to them. Oh my gosh, I'll have that again. No, just look in the camera, oh, okay. tell them that they'll be rewarded. You will be rewarded. Like that is honestly what my life has shown and I think I don't, maybe that's what you uh, can say as well. 100%. And so that's my, that's what I tell the little babies who write me. I feel like you're talking to like the 11 year old Noor who picked <laughs> up the violin. And I would love to it. see 11 year old Noor. I wonder if there's any video of me playing violin. I was obsessed with it. I had a similar experience with my parents and them being like, it's not that serious. No. But 
I mean, we've both found our purpose in different ways and now we're here and you're doing this and I get to admire it every single day. And I'm so grateful to that. Like, I'm I'm so grateful to you you. for real. Like, you know, for giving people the chance to share their voice and their stories. Thank you. That's very powerful. Thank you. So I want to ask you, how is your heart doing these days? My heart? Your heart. Uh, well, I my heart is is feeling very happy, and I'm very excited for this music. Um, you know, there's a lot of like political, global things. There's things happening in the world. Yeah, and th- I think it's just hard to sometimes like shut that off because I I like I like knowing what's happening. I read the news every day, but sometimes that does weigh me down. Um, but I'm blessed to have people in my life that I love very much and. To releasing this music soon. So I'm, I must say, I'm very. My soul is happy. I'm so happy for you. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank with you, Dora.